So, uh, hi, uh, so my name is Manuela Veloso and I'm currently the head of JP Morgan Chase AI Research Group. And I also uh, have been a faculty at Carnegie Mellon University as heard with uh, Simon University professor in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about AI in finance in particular, the scope and give some examples. And uh, I first I want to just spend one, <laughs> one minute on AI as a science of components. AI is, uh, is a science and engineering that has as goal eventually capturing every aspect of intelligence, every aspect of like uh, uh, learning within a computer, within an algorithm. Well, well described such that it can be uh, simulated by an algorithm. And it's literally, uh, this concept of every aspect of intelligence leads us to have many facets of such problems. So we have language, we have speech, we have computer vision, we have all sorts of uh, cognitive functions, search, planning, learning, uh, representation, uh, optimization, uh, learning from experience, negotiations, and then we do have the actual actuation. So in some sense, it, 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 we, we know that these, uh, when we see researchers in AI, the science leads into uh, several aspects of these uh, AI spectrum. I've been working on the integration of these, uh, you know, perception, cognition, and action, or data decision making and action, for a long time. And in particular, at Carnegie Mellon, we have developed a lot of autonomous mobile robots that exhibit. Uh, their perception through cameras, uh, their cognition through algorithms, planning and learning algorithms on board. And actually these um, machines, these robots move, so they execute, they act in the environment. So I'm very, uh, I'm fascinated by this uh, uh, integration of all these capabilities into complete systems. But of course, I also understand the multiple components. And in my talk, I'll try to uh, cover both aspects of the field of AI uh, uh, and uh, uh, as examples in the finance domain. So I just now will delve, I mean, I, I, so you I'll delve into this uh, finance domain, though it was important to share that the video of the robots, that, that concept of autonomous robots, and I'll come back to it later, because in fact, I've been doing these uh, autonomous robots for 30 plus years, and therefore, uh, that's really something that um, I've spent a lot of time researching on. I've been at JP Morgan basically uh, two and a half years, almost three, and, uh, and uh, I want now to share why it's so exciting and fascinating, this field of AI in finance. So think about JP Morgan Chase or other financial institutions that may have different types of like functions, different types of uh, lines of business. You can think about like investment banking, retail banking, commercial banking, uh, wealth management, asset and wealth management, and in fact also the internal cross-firm functions. So this is like the type of environment in which you now have to bring AI and machine learning uh, to this environment. It's a, you know, a very large company and because it's so large that it produces an enormous amounts of data, and also it has uh, the concept of having like uh, applied AI teams close to the business and uh, and trying to um, get functionality across all the units. And then there is AI research that is also firm wide trying to bring up eventually a transformation also uh, through AI to the to the company. So let me just focus first on just explaining to you how we organize, in fact, these particular kind of like uh, aspirational goals for the AI research at JP Morgan. So this is, uh, so or let me just uh, back up a second and say, so having an AI research group at JP Morgan itself is kind of like pioneering or new because we are used to research groups at the tech companies, but within a financial industry, I think that uh, as AI research not apply AI is a privilege and it's a really wonderful place to be. So uh, so we divided these goals into like domain goals, financial domain, and we are going to focus on how to predict and in fact affect economic systems. And then I'll, 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 we also care about these data. So we focus 
on how do we actually liberate this data safely. And I'll mention also something about uh, the, this data uh, goal. And then we also have this problem of eradicating financial crime. In this talk, I'm not going to focus on this aspect. And then we have three very interesting kind of like uh, goals that are related to our stakeholders. Like in a firm, you have your own employees, your own customers or clients, and then you have the regulators. So most of the companies, and in particular the financial industry, has these three components as stakeholders. And then eventually when we build this AI for the multiple functions, we care uh, in our group in establishing this um, ethically and socially good AI also as a goal. So in some sense, you have these seven goals that drive uh, uh, the research of uh, AI research at JP Morgan. So now that we did this small introduction, I'm going to delve into uh, analyzing with you about three cases, uh, three projects in which these uh, uh, AI and finance um, in the AI research, pro, uh, you know, combines techniques of AI with uh, important fit, uh, functions in the business. So let me just start with this trading problem. So we all know that uh, traders basically uh, follow how the markets are going and they have to analyze these uh, volatility of the market, these changes, and they are captured in terms of assets as time series functions on the value of these assets changing. And if you have never been to a trading floor, I have never been, we've seen in, on TV, uh, we've seen on movies, these, these, these issue about uh, uh, being surrounded by displays of this information in this uh, kind of format. So when I went to this trader's floor, I mean, long ago in, uh, when I joined in 2008, there was this overwhelming kind of function analysis. But the interesting thing is that I realized that after all, uh, the decisions were guided by images. And that actually was a big aha in my mind because uh, it, the, 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 the actual numbers on how the time series was changing was not being used on paper or people were not looking at vectors or, of, of time series over time. They basically looked at images on the screen. So as we know, images have been like very successful within our uh, machine learning community to, to learn concepts through, in fact, deep neural nets. So I actually decided to see if we could actually create uh, images of this time series data that would capture classification of buy, no buy signals. So look at, uh, so this is very important. This is, was very beautiful because you can think that uh, we are used to seeing chairs, tables being classified and apples and oranges and cats and dogs and all sorts of like other classification problems of objects, images of objects. But uh, here it's images of actually time series data that we actually represented as by chopping some kind of like size of these uh, time series. And we literally converted into some representation, candlestick, this is a candlestick representation, but then we use just with the plane function. And we, we basically transformed it into an image, a matrix, a little pixels, the actual image of this time series. And we were able to basically classify uh, these images into buy, no buy signals, uh, classes, two classes, by trying a, a neural net. So uh, look at so, so what I'm excited about sharing with you is in fact, and probably some of you have known this already, is that we could now think about using this machinery of image classification through deep neural nets to classify known objects, to classify other types of, of, of classes. So we were able to perform really well, and we have been doing these more and more and more on uh, different types of images and uh, that have to do with the visual input that humans take to make decisions. So I'm going just to delve a little bit more on these, uh, uh, you know, reasoning through learning from images. Uh, uh, in, so it's not object recognition, but it's now this reasoning 
through these learning from images just uh, along one more aspect, which is the prediction aspect. So I've shown you the classification aspect in which we can classify uh, these images into by no by signals. And uh, we also have done uh, research on trying to predict based on videos, predict uh, interactions between multiple uh, assets through uh, video. And I'm, I, I don't think I have the time to cover that, but I'm going, or, or also attention focus, like specific points of like um, uh, visual attention. But I'm going to focus on trying to uh, tell you a little bit about this problem, not of classification, but of completion of an image, of the future of an image, uh, and which will be like this prediction on time series. And the interesting thing is that we basically, again, did this uh, neural net, this uh, learning, this autoencoder, in which we trained this network with input up to some uh, this gray area. And then eventually we uh, trained with particular uh, completions or, uh, you know, the, the rest of the time series. And we have like uh, multiple algorithms to, uh, to uh, make the prediction. And our algorithm, and he, this is a work done by, with um, Zheng Zhang and then uh, uh, Tucker Bolch and Naftali Cohen. And uh, you'll see at the end that we have uh, pointed to the publications. But if you look at this visual autoencoder, visual AE, which is the Mondrian P, you'll see this pink uh, region, and the ground truth is here in the first column, that is very well uh, predicted. And we have all sorts in the paper, all sorts of metrics to compare how these images uh, match the ground truth image. And uh, it's a very thorough comparison, very kind of careful to comparison. But I chose to show you also from a visual point of view, this comparison along this way. So think about the training of the neural net as, uh, with um, being done up to 80, uh, you know, like in the beginning of the signal. We actually have these uh, kind of 80 days and then the last 20 days are the prediction part. We played with different numbers, 90, 10, you know, uh, other just uh, 95, 5, all sorts of like different numbers. But the interesting thing is like this. So um, look at these predictions on different types of assets, different types of real signals. And uh, the, the little dotted line shows up to the point that um, uh, the prediction, uh, that the, the, the input was given. And then the gray area is the ground truth of the signal, how it evolved, and the red area, the red function, the red curve is the prediction. Now, the prediction here, again, it's really very accurate. And uh, as you can see, it kind of follows very well the real signal, uh, the truth signal, but it's done as completing an image an image. And so this is why I think that it's very interesting and compelling to see this um, representation of the time series data as an image enables us to actually in the comparisons we've made to uh, do better predictions on this completion than in fact using other numerical techniques. So uh, this is a long story that I'm reducing it just to some highlights here. And I, I'll be, uh, I think that it would be very exciting for, uh, to delve into this, but this is what you really, uh, what I really wanted to tell you is this concept of really capturing time series as images. And here, just so for comparison, for example, these are other numerical machine learning method results. The red line here shows that, in fact, the predictions are much worse, even if there is some uh, variation than the, the actual uh, Mondrian P. So this is the first topic I told you about, and now I'm going to uh, use just rush through telling you a little bit about now other methods too that we have been using for learning, for example, in over-the-counter markets. So here is like a different scenario in which now 
instead of a classification scenario, we are trying to, we, we, we are analyzing how agents actually act. So we are in the re reinforcement learning scenario. But the reason why I chose these out of all the projects is because of the representation aspect too. So you think about all the markets, uh, basically multiple agents interacting, ones like uh, market makers that they, they stream prices and investors that basically decide with which market maker they are going to transact. Uh, uh, and so uh, the secret here in some sense has been how do we actually represent these type of like uh, problem such that we can include non-learning agents like uh, investors uh, eventually in this scenario and then having these multiple um, market maker agents as learning agents. The, the secret here, in, or one of the aspects, is that we uh, represent these agents in terms of like uh, their observations, their actions, and their rewards, again, uh, in, as a reinforcement learning uh, scenario uh, environment. But this, the, 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 these complication of these uh, ma ma market uh, maker agents is captured basically by um, parameters. So we have a space that includes the risk aversion of these agents and the connectivity to the investor, to different investor types. So these, uh, so we compress like what is to be learned into eventually the adjustment of this parameter space. So there is this representation in terms of like uh, uh, these two parameters. The risk aversion has to do, and I didn't go into the finance aspects, but it has to do with how much inventory do we hedge. So, which is like uh, uh, you get the positive reward from trading and you get negative if you hold your assets for hedging. And there are some levels of like these trade-off between hedging and actually uh, trading. Uh, that is captured by how adverse uh, these agents are to risk. So these are parameters of the domain, but by representing them over this probability distribution, you can actually then learn. So we have used a Ray uh, reinforcement learning library for shared policy training, and we were able to show that basically these uh, market makers can learn uh, behaviors that are really that are realistic and make sense. So for example, based on the net position that they, uh, a market maker has, net position is like the, the, the value of some assets. It's like the, uh, the, that, the amount that the, the market maker is in possession. Then you can actually, as, uh, in your uh, price offering, you can actually learn to skew prices. Uh, so you adjust the relative price of bidding and asking based on your inventory, uh, which is this net position. And interestingly, this is not um, this this is not something that was given, and the reinforcement learning multi-agent system was able to really learn these great behaviors. So uh, just to finish this area, because it's a it, there is. Um, there is a lot to think about here because it's a problem that is not necessarily a, a, a typical game problem. It's a market. But then there is this issue about how do we represent it and then how do we actually uh, uh, do the learning experiments. This simulation is very powerful. And here are two papers that you may want to look at. These are Nelson Vadori and uh, Sumitra Ganesh, with Roshan Threddy and myself, we have these papers and Men Men the Zoo uh, on um, these NeurIPS this year, well, last year, and uh, ICAF, this International Conference on AI in Finance, which the first one was in 2020 and the next one is coming now for 2021. But this is a multi-agent reinforcement learning problem that is able to tune the strategies of these market makers by representing the agents with these uh, parameters and then adjusting the parameters based on reward and simulation. One final thought here is that also the uh, calibration of these parameters with respect to real data is very important because eventually you want the, the simulation to be realistic. Also that calibration was um, uh, captured as a reinforcement learning problem in which the parameters that we change 
again, are the actions of these re reinforcement learning based calibrator. And that's basically the, the topic of the NeurIPS paper. So, okay, two things I told you, like Mondrian, well, Mondrian classification, Mondrian prediction, based all on image classification, and here now the reinforcement learning aspect. And I'll tell you one more thing, while I still have a few minutes, which is based on uh, something that's very important for me, which has been like this interaction with a specific AI uh, algorithm, uh, and an intelligent AI system, in particular at CMU with the cobot robot, we basically set, set requests for this robot, go to the Manuela's office, bring this coffee to some place, go to the lab, do this. It was all language that was basically translated into uh, execution and learning. So the robot is able to ask, I don't know what you mean by coffee, and eventually it learns by interacting with the humans, not necessarily by, a lot of, by, the, by being given a lot of classified data, but by these interactions. And now, based on this, I'm going to show you something that is uh, very important uh, at uh, JP Morgan, which is basically document generation. So you, uh, we have to create reports, PowerPoint slides, uh, all sorts of like um, translation of a representation, which is all these tables, maybe Excel tables, speech conversations with clients, uh, journeys of people using like uh, the multiple products of the firm. So there is all this um, activity, all this history, like uh, the robot moving around, there is all this history, and then eventually there is a need to understand what's going on there. And most of the time this is done uh, by transforming that representation into something else, pie charts, histograms, heat maps, all sorts of like uh, um, language capturing insights. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting problem of, of, of representation change. So we automated this along some dimensions and we created this DocuBot, which is a bot for a document generated bot. And in particular, AIPPDX generates basically based on, image, on language uh, some uh, slides. So I'm just going to go over these, uh, these this final uh, video just to show you an example of this docubot and I'm going to just uh, for, fast forward this uh, and uh, just show you this is work with Venit and uh, Venit um, uh, Rafi, uh, Salima Muri and uh, Armine Norvarch and uh, Andrea Stefanucci and Samina Shah and myself. So, uh, so here it is. So think about this problem of actually asking some kind of like AI system, a document, how can I help you today? Please translate for the last POV by order for company ticker XYZ today. So basically you have language and you now learn to map this language to really like parameters of this template. So all these slides uh, are generated automatically uh, from the language to this new representation, which is a pre-specified one way or another, like through this template, but then all the parameters are in fact learned to do the right mapping. And in fact, I'm going to uh, uh, show you here an example in which uh, DocuBot actually, when asked to make changes, uh, uh, it, it, can, it, it can ask when it does not know. For example, center the figure title, uh, DocuBot might not have learned what center the figure title means, and then it asks, shall I make the change for all the figures or for a specific figure? And then the user may say, for all the figures, I believe here is what it says, and it learns this mapping between center the figure title. Next time you interact with DocuBot, it might suggest, do you mean all the figures? So this amazing interaction between DocuBot and the user is a learning experience from beginning to end. You, and, and, and DocuBot uh, accepts commands of the sort that changes the appearance of the slides, colors and centered and size. Uh, it uh, uh, accepts commands that change the content of the, uh, content of the slides, change the data, for give me four years instead of eight or and also it can actually tell, save these commands that I gave you into a new template. So you are learning new templates, you are learning to adapt an existing template and you are going to re you are able to actually revise. So this is a very a kind of beautiful example of in fact these uh, 
these um, learning by interaction with humans of uh, performing like the robot moving around a complete cycle of getting the data, getting thinking about what to do and learning and actually doing. So the slides are all generated automatically. So here is an example in which there was a, 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 the, the user asked for an additional heat map and here at the end of the presentation. So in summary, there are many other projects that I work on uh, that we work on as AI research. I mean, we have these document and information discovery, some a lot of learning, customer satisfaction, uh, detection and prevention of financial crime, regulation and compliance, all sorts of like fairness in markets, ethics and values, and a lot of research on trying to improve the client experience. So, you know, it's a, 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 a large group uh, and they all that we do falls within these seven categories. I invite you to go to this publication uh, place in which we have actually the description of our work on JP Morgan dot com slash AI, as well as publications that I also have available off my CMU webpage. So as we still have a few minutes, I'm just going to give you one final thought in terms of learning and representation of, uh, of great impact in uh, AI and finance. So, oh, okay, by the way, uh, if you want to send me an email, it's just malala.rolosetchukumarmachase.com. But I want to just spend one minute on this uh, additional project. I was just saving it in case we had like a few minutes left, which I think we do, which is this, um, this very interesting problem that uh, of like, um, how can I say, uh, automatically transforming data in multiple representations to a standardized representation. So what happens is the following. So financial data is stored in a huge, in a huge variety of Excel files, tabular formats, and it's a, a literally non, in a non-standard uh, form. So it's kind of uh, it, it's kind of like um, difficult for a machine learning system to use financial data coming from multiple sources because the format of the data, the representation is so no non-uniform. So I mean, in our March in our group and Samina Shah, uh, literally, um, um, especially also Armine, got tired of really like these uh, constant fixing up the data so that the machine learning could extract the patterns, could uh, uh, transform the representation to input to DocuBot, and so forth. So, we have introduced these uh, standardized financial extraction uh, AI, these Sphinx, that is that converts the data in any format, Excel, into a unified standard form. So uh, it's able to basically, it's a wonderful uh, AI kind of system that is able to understand these multiple titles of columns, USD, in million and is able to convert this particular kind of representation to a standard financial data representation. Here we mean by financial data, basically uh, tables of numbers changing over time. So I'll show you this, which is really interesting. Uh, so here is uh, uh, the example that was just in the previous slide, but if you spend some time looking at this, it is converted like these numbers uh, 2187 it's here as a value so the financial data is always converted into metrics submetrics sub submetrics uh, as period start period end value type and scale and this scale for example in US dollars is extracted from these titles so if this is natural language basically parsing that or mining that representation to extract all this information that then you can use in the standardized representation. And just for a feeling of how compelling this is from my point of view, look at this beautiful kind of different uh, financial data. The macroeconomic is there, rates and inflations now are instead of being represented like these are per row, and also this is transformed to the same representation. So I just wanted to finish and I can come back to, uh, I can come back to this just to tell you that indeed, um, 
just to finish, that this is the, the AI in finance is a is a fascinating field of of, of like um, trying to uh, bring AI to really through large scale and challenging representations, be it numbers, be it time series like represented visual, the whole the whole uh, the whole operation, the whole thinking is all about data. It's all about information. And I did not focus here, except for the strings example, on all the work we do on looking at actually textual data, you know, documents, hundreds of documents that then you can extract a lot of information from. So um, I believe we are out of time. I, 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 and uh, I, I don't have, I forget when we started, but I think. We're out of time, and um, um, please send me an email if you want to know more about AI and finance. Visit our website. I believe our revised external website is going to be available soon. And uh, I thank you very much for this invitation, and I hope to hear from you. So welcome. Uh, uh, Manuela to um, to the Q&A session. Uh, we already have a couple of questions coming in, and we'll probably I'll be posting them on behalf of the um, of the people asking the questions. Uh, so the question one here it says, do you have any uncertainty bands on the prediction of the time series prediction? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Uh, definitely, we have a range, and we have uncertainty as the 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 machine learning model outputs the prediction. We use the, 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 the certainty that the machine learning model has on the multiple type levels of prediction. And as you saw, uh, probably, or maybe I don't know if I explained, I don't remember if I explained it in detail, this was pre-recorded, but for every time step in the future, we have different predictions. And therefore, um, you know, the predictions that are closer to the moment are, you have a higher confidence than 20 minutes later, uh, on 20 uh, time steps later, and uh, and so that's um, that's basically yes, we have these predictions. Okay, thank you so much. So the second question is about how you created the training data for the time um, series images, and the question is how did you create the patches, the image patches? Did you do cropping, and how did you handle different scales of time period? Okay, so this is a parameter of the this is a parameter of the system, but <clears throat> I want you to understand that, that this time series data and also answering the next question, how do you know why image you know representation works back then numerical methods? So what happens is that this uh, time series data is actually represented as an image, as an image. So uh, think about the picture of an apple and an orange or a cat and a dog, they are images. And vision images have been used to basically capture a lot of objects. Here you are basically creating um, a plot of a time series data into an actual image, all white except for some kind of like non-white pixels that represent the time series going. Okay, so the the length of the um, the width of that image, how many steps we use of the time series to train is one variable of the system, one parameter of the system. We tried several. I believe we currently were, were using 20 minutes of time of time series data of the financial data. We did another time series, but the, on the financial data, I think we used 20 minutes, and we basically uh, chop the image, uh, create that image, and train with that. Why is this better than numerical methods? Uh, well, I believe that uh, numerical methods suffer more from um, the actual numbers themselves um, and uh, the variations of the numbers, whether it's like um, imagine an interval from 100 to 120 or an, an interval from $1 to like $1.05. And so uh, they are probably are more sensitive to that type of like variation of the actual values. And the, the, the image just gets like the shape of the dynamics of the time series. And the beautiful thing about this work, again, is to show that um, basically that visual information can be used in addition or instead of the numerical information. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the response to the question. I think that we are moving into the uh, multi-agent um, uh, market maker 
uh, section of the of the talk. And the question is, when defining the binary problem, buy, no buy, do you also consider the symmetric problem, sell, no sell? And if so, do you weigh both models to ultimately make a decision for whether to buy or no action or sell? We have not done that, but yes, uh, we were. So basically, we have not done yet. We were like just using uh, these buy, no buy signals, which were actually so the no buy was uh, when you didn't buy. So we basically used all the data available and you just think about the window uh, moving over time and we chopped these 20 minutes. We got the time series data for those 20 minutes and then basically we associated whether the traders bought or not bought the actual uh, asset. And that's how you train the system. We were using, uh, bas we didn't use cell data but again, we, 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 we could. It's the point here that matters is that we are able to associate a decision, not a classification of an object, with the actual image. And so when we have done these in several other scenarios, other images of other nature. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so going here again on the representation aspects, uh, the question here says, in some domain, you know, like pathology, medical imaging, the representation and color code as shown to affect the performance. Did you try different representation of the images of the graph? Like yeah, different very, color for the plots. A very good question. Uh, in fact, um, you are right. You just touched this very important domain, which is medical imaging. And again, you know that uh, doctors are masters of using images or using their uh, what they see uh, to uh, extract a lot of information from the the image representation being like we are pale or we have like deep circles around our eyes, everything is used in terms of like the image, uh, let alone like the EEG numbers. Uh, everything is kind of used to make a diagnosis, to make a, a prediction, to make a, a, a classification. So uh, indeed, we tried different representation. We tried, as you probably saw on the, on the, on the talk, you, you, we use this candlestick-like representation, which is associating amplitudes with little black or white bars, if it's like going up or down. And we tried just the actual dots in the image for the time series we tried. We did not use color so far, it's true, but I, I think that actually the initial, the very first initial version, the background was not white, was uh, blue, and uh, the signal was, I don't know, dark, uh, black, or red. So it, it, uh, the, the, it, I think that everything is like a, an open kind of like area of research on what the image should look like. But um, we did try several, and it didn't affect that much the results. So we went to just this black and white picture uh, that captures the signal. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the the next section, the next question is touching the last section, which is talking about human um, and machine interaction, learning from those interaction. And the question says that can you elaborate on the input and level of training data of DocuBot, as well as the learning objectives to train it. Okay. This is a very good question. Uh, so let's let's be clear here. DocuBot only learns through interaction with the human. It doesn't learn from any training data. So there is no accumulation of data. DocuBot basically, um, or, or let's see, DocuBot basically is able to um, uh, map a language uh, that people ask, please plot these, please do that, uh, turn these into that, and map these into um, actions that it can take with respect to that translation of the data. So those, those um, mappings from language to actions were indeed trained on some data uh, with a limited vocabulary. But the science there is not that initial training phase, but it's the interaction in the next interaction. So what happens is that then when a human says, you say, center the figure or do some kind of language and uh, the, the docubot does not uh, have anything mapped to that type of like language, it asks the human, what do you mean? And as the human responds to this type of like, what do you mean? Then the knowledge that the DocuBot has gets updated. So it's kind of like an, um, a continuous learning system rather than 
uh, trading system. So if you are not, so you could have started this tabula rasa with no training at all, but then the interaction would have been tedious from day one. Like, do make the, this particular kind of like a customer report, and the, immediately Doc, you what with that? I don't know what is his report. Tell me what is his report, and then the person had to explain. Go to that particular file and blah. And the DocuBot would map that request in language to that kind of action it can take. So you, it does. So the the science there is a, the same way that we did in um, with our robot at TMU. The, the the concept is that it will never stop learning. So it has learned something. It maps some language to some actions. But as soon as the human uses some language that is not clear and not mapped to anything inside of uh, of like the knowledge base of the robot, it just asks. Uh, I mean, in this case, of your boss, it just asks. The human re 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 answers, and that answer is encapsulated back into the knowledge base. So it see. So here is like a, why I like so much to talk about this uh, this paradigm in which this is learning from experience. This is continuous yeah. learning. It's not like. A, you collect all these data, these are all the cats of the world, you give them to some neural net, and magically the neural net knows now what's the cat for eternity. This is not really what's going on here. It's that you start the system with some kind of like mapping from some language to some skills, and then as it goes, as it goes, it's just capable of asking for help. This DocuBot is like saying, I don't know what you mean, tell me. The person says, DocuBot learns. And it's continuously on these Tell me what you mean, answer, and and absorb that answer. If the person said something wrong, okay, big deal. Next time the robot is going to, or the document is going to propose, this is what you mean. The person says, no, I meant this. And over time, it converges to have the right mapping. Wow, this awesome. is a cool question here. Play yeah. Here. Okay. Yeah, so before we get to that, um, there's question seven, which says, you know, was buy or no buy? Uh, decision also tried on prices of cryptocurrencies, uh, not really. just stock market. Okay. Not really, but on the other hand, I tell you the principle of using images as time series. It doesn't really matter uh, as much what is the actual target. And I, we, I mean, and we, uh, to tell you, I cannot even say not really. I mean, we have applied it to so many scenarios uh, that uh, maybe we have done cryptocurrencies yet, but I don't think so. Okay. But think about this. What the only thing we are capturing is how some variable, the price of some asset or the price of some cryptocurrency, varies over time. So you get all these little kind of like um, time series data, up and down, and all of that, and you basically use this as an image. Don't don't forget that we really are not putting any semantics on how it's changing. It's just the actual image. And then humans magically see, oh, this is going deep, 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 deep. Well, if it's going up, so it's going to also probably go slow up. Who knows what we see? But the machine is able to uh, learn these dynamics, you know? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the next question says, has any of your code for reasoning from images on numerical data extraction from spreadsheets been open sourced? Please advise. If yes, can you please share the link? And be while chatting is popular among traders, as per my understanding, it's scarcely considered a science. And charting is thought to be like a self-fulfilling prophecy that depends on the sufficient number of traders believing in it. Can widespread adoption of representing numeric data as images possibly increase systemic, systemic risk? It's a deep question. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, you know, the, the, the code now to do the classification of vision as is that time series data will be available soon. It's not yet um, in a shape that's like so uh, polished that can be made open that people can use with all these parameters and all these things. But keep in touch, Manuela Manuela at jpmorgan.com. Send me email. We'll keep you in this list. There are several people there in the mailing list waiting for this code to be uh, made open source. Um, so charting, I'm not, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, don't forget that indeed this kind of like um, uh, appearance of the data is not us who have invented it. If you go to a trader's floor, if you go to conversations among traders, then basically they are always looking at how things are changing over time. This particular kind of like display of time series data is very common. 
for actually for humans to reason about uh, what to do. So I'm not sure what you mean by uh, not consider the science, but in some sense, it's not a science or less science. It's just a fact that people have used images of time series data to make decisions. And the, la the last one, which you say, uh, can widespread adoption of representing as images possibly increase systematic risk. You know, we, uh, we, uh, the, 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 what I want you to understand is that um, this is, um, you know, we are in this conference of representation, the value of representation. This is a representation uh, kind of contribution, okay? So uh, whether it's used uh, uh, better or worse, I don't know. But the point is like this. When, when have we talked uh, often about using uh, an image as a representation of a time series? It's not really common. We have been talking about representing uh, language and embeddings. We talk about representing, you know, all sorts of objects as image. We talk about like uh, so many representations. Okay. So the, the, the interesting thing here is like, okay, guess what? Time series data can be represented also as an image. That's the main thing. Now, uh, whether we, uh, for example, we have been doing video also, multiple images and animating, multiple time series correlations. We have been trying to, to, to move on. And the only thing I'm saying to this audience, and you guys are the experts in representations. We, I love representations from an AI point of view. It's really fascinating, fascinating, this concept of representing concepts uh, in different ways. I'm telling you, we even are looking at correlations between time series data that goes up and down as videos that sh show the stretch, show how things are correlated, instead of ne necessarily depending so much on the actual numbers. So we are just going one step uh, ahead and bringing in 2021 to everybody's um, uh, consideration that in addition to speech and text, there are what we see. And what we see besides objects has a lot to do with other uh, displays of information that it's not only objects. And in some sense, um, you know that being it doctors, being it scientists, being it us teachers, when we teach something, how much we know that that wonderful quote, like a, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So there you go. Let's delve into pictures, pictures. that capture other things than actual objects. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So, so the next question probably is you know, continuing on that thought that I feel saying any non-traditional statistical techniques uh, are performing older or traditional statistical based techniques, but for this particular purpose, for credit risk um, prediction, like for default prediction, for example, based on external or internal ratings when they exist, please advise. Very, can you elaborate on this thing? Very good question. Again, uh, so uh, my talk or my thoughts are not exactly on advice at the financial um, decision making level. See, so I don't, I, I did not uh, uh, task, I didn't organize the task to be a financial um, domain. Uh, uh, see what I'm saying? So yeah. I, 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 I cannot say much about kinds of errors uh, in. The, you know, all these, uh, so that's not the focus. And I, we, I'll be happy to do another talk just on finances. This was a task on, this was a talk on the value of representation while in fact within the financial domain, but uh, it was just to alert everybody, whether they're in finance or not, of these new things that we are working on. And I do insist, I mean, you, I see that, uh, you, I mean, I, it's always Mondrian that attracts uh, more questions and, okay, one or two in the people are perfect. But you know what, that multi-agent um, uh, kind of like uh, um, calibration and the multi-agent prediction is uh, absolutely fantastic from the point of view of looking at something. So, you know, you, you look at this very complex domain as a financial domain, is a multi-agent simulation, and you are able to have these agents learn strategy that is very kind of like real, I mean, very realistic. So this is also another type of like a representation contribution because in some sense, by capturing these agents with types, 
types that had like parameters. Now you you embed all the complexity of what an agent is into these vector of parameters. And somehow the learning goes into these vector of parameters until eventually it adjusts them into something that is learnable and makes sense learning. So think about all of these things I told you and uh, I was listening to my talk and I didn't have that idea enough. These are all representation contributions, the images, the agents as like vectors of type. So all this confusion, what do they want, their intention, their this, their that. Okay, let's capture a space of features, a space of types, a space of parameters, and then let's adjust them to achieve some, some value. And then the DocuBot comes as a representation, this change of representation. You know, what DocuBot is so beautiful is the fact that Internally, it's all these numbers, all these kind of tables, and then magically you have to translate these into some charts, and you have to translate these into some language, and now you automate in some sense and learn this change of representation with the input from a human, but you are trying to say, yeah, that's it, this representation can be changed automatically through AI to another representation, so it's not French to English, or Chinese to Portuguese, or French, or Italian to English, whatever. It's like, okay, from these tables and databases to something else, you know, that includes language and charts that humans understand better. So it's all about this wonderful area of, uh, of bringing AI and learning to the space of playing with representation. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, thank you for, for digging deep into that. Um, our time is almost up, but we'll take a couple of more questions. So this is more, this is very interesting. So do you have a sense of the kind of error made by a visual buy or sell predictor versus a time series based buy or sell predictor? Do they seem to have different biases and make categorically different errors? So oh, that's, a very, that's a very good point. We did compare uh, the, the, the image based trained neural net with a, an actual uh, numerical based neural net. The difference is not major, okay? However, you know, when you represent data of time series data for to be used with actual numbers, with actual uh, values, you have to be very careful because it, in order to learn from something that varies between 100 and 200 and 1 and 2, you have to normalize. Otherwise, the neural net is going to get attached to those numbers, 100, 105, and then you give numbers 1 and 1.5, and it does not really learn, while the, the, while the, the image base learns basically shape. And the other one is very sensitive to the actual numbers, the representation of the numbers. So, but again, I don't have an actual, how do you say, scientific answer to these or a good experiments that tell me about uh, the kinds of errors um, and uh, the, 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 I don't, I don't know. This is all uh, questions that um, anyone can now pursue. But again, the important thing is to understand that magically, in quotes, magically, a time series data that has been treated as a bunch of numbers, as a vector of numbers, an L a a LSTM or whatever you want to do, you don't need to do any of that. You capture that as an image, and there you are. So that's again. Look at the beautiful thing we have invented. This. Uh, uh, machine learning techniques to capture uh, temporal sequence, LSTMs, and so forth. And now, okay, what about if we can represent that, that temporal sequence in an image that captures the dynamics? Okay, maybe we can just use that image. And I tell you another example. I mean, if you want to go to my website on publications at Carnegie Mellon, Something interesting, I mean, it also has the ones that JP Morgan more recently. Something interesting we did in the old days with uh, robot soccer, it doesn't matter. So these robots move on the field like crazy, and we wanted to learn what the team, the adversarial team was doing. And we basically uh, used the whole trajectory, the trajectory, the whole tra not actually what they were doing at every moment. We collapsed, uh, we compiled an episode, and that became a curve, which was a trajectory, and we used those lines. I mean, it was, no, we didn't use that image. We had other methods of comparing them. But I think there is some science here and some interesting insights about representing things that are changing over time as like their dynamics in one shot. Anyway, 
Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, our time is fast going, um, but I actually have a couple of um, uh, questions even from my own side to you. So one, one question is, given all the kind of experiments we've done in this different you know, problem space, uh, so what do you think about using an end-to-end -end approach and pipeline approach in building autonomous agents? In which you have different modules that are connected together in series, or to just go from you know actual future space and go to make prediction. Which one do you find more useful or rewarding in the work you've done? Okay, so this is a good question too. So I do think that um, I have spent all my life doing end-to-end -end, uh, solutions because uh, when I build autonomous robots, I mean that was end-to-end. -end. You have to process the vision, feed it up to some planner and then eventually fit it to some motors that the robot moves and continuously get more information. So I'm very, how do you say, um, experienced and passionate about end-to-end -end solutions. However, I have to tell you that when we build end-to-end -end solutions, the secret is that uh, we have to break everything into pieces, uh, the little skills, okay, go to point, or DocuBot, which is, plot a, a little kind of like pie chart. So if we don't break into pieces, even when we put everything together, first, we cannot improve the pieces and we cannot reuse them, second. So what I'm saying is like this, you know, end-to-end -end problems are hard to build. And then the next end-to-end, -end, if it cannot transfer anything from the previous one, is a nightmare. So, uh, so for example, when we did robot soccer, you know, uh, the big thing was to do then mini golf also with the same robots, you know, without having, again, end to end, but without having to redo everything. So in DocuBot also, don't forget, and I don't emphasize here enough, DocuBot is used for many different types of documents. Uh, uh, the PowerPoint document, charts, uh, it generates text. The 10Q is a report very common in companies there are quarterly uh, reports about the, how the company is doing. It's all language, no charts. It's also done by DocuBot. It's all uh, different types of translations. But the, the fact is that while building the end-to-end -end system, you build these components, and then they are all reused. So, okay. so this is like, uh, I tell you, this is the secret. I mean, I love end-to-end, -end, but if you do end-to-end -end every time starting from scratch, you just do a few in your lifetime. Yeah, I think we are right on time. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You uh, really Very appreciate nice. uh, all the questions and you know people who ask, uh, ask those questions. Thank you for for answering them, uh, for asking them. And uh, for those that have any questions we couldn't take, you can reach out directly, or Manuel can probably uh, or reply to you directly on the Rocket chat, or you can reach out, reach out to her directly on, through our email, which she had already given during the during the talk. Uh, thank yeah. you for your time. Thank you. Very much.